So welcome back to the Tabernacle series. I have a small replica in here in front of you so you can kind of see what we're going to be talking about. This is uh, Tabernacle Part 1. Last week was the Shekel. It really didn't have a whole lot to do. It was more toward the Temple than the Tabernacle, but it's kind of the same thing. Now we're going to be doing the Tabernacle, and then next week you'll see more and how it all goes together. This is kind of like a representation of that. This is an artist's rendition. So, the Hebrew word for the tabernacle is upper right-hand corner. It's called Mishkan. And there it is, the Mem, the Sheen, the Kaf, and the Nun. There are different words that are used in Hebrew for it. For instance, if you say a pen that you write with, you could say pen, ballpoint pen, ink pen, writing instrument, just depends on what you were talking about and so on. So same thing with the t uh, tabernacle. You have Ochel, which means tent pavilion, tabernacle, shelter. You have Aron HaKodesh, and Ha is the, Kodesh is holy, and Aron is yes, the same word for Moses' brother, Aaron, and it means the ark. So if you didn't know that Moses' brother Aaron's name meant ark, now you do. So it meant the holy ark or the tabernacle because guess what the tabernacle housed? The holy ark. It was Mishkan, house, habitation, repository, temple, sanctuary, tabernacle, and sukkah. Sukkah is the word they use for the last feast, which is the feast of booths or the feast of tabernacles. Hmm, the feast of tabernacles. But they use the word sukkah because sukkah is kind of a, a temporary structure like the tabernacle is. And it has kind of an open roof so you can see the stars. So these are the different words used for the tabernacle. Mishkan has the numerical value of 410. And guess what else has a numerical value of 410? The Son of God. So if you don't think that the tabernacle is all about the Messiah, Jesus, it's all in the name Mishkan, which means the Son of God. Isn't that cool? All right, the tabernacle, Exodus 25, 8, and 9. The reason that the whole tabernacle came to be in the first place is because build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. That word dwell is mishkan, which means tabernacle. God says, I want to be with you. Build me a place so I can be with you. In accordance to everything I'm going to show you as a pattern of the tabernacle and all its furniture, I'm going to get to this. It's going to blow your mind here in just a minute. The pattern that I'm showing you, that's a little bit coming up, but just keep that in mind. This word here, dwell, is mishkan. He wants to be with us. Pointing to the Messiah, Mishkan. John 1.1, 1, 1, going to the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And He was God in the beginning. Yes. When you skip down a little bit further into verse 14, this is verse 1. When you go down to verse 14, it says, The Word became some flesh or human, and what? Mishkan. Tabernacled, Mishkan, with us. And we saw His Shekinah, or His glory, and the glory of the Father's Son, full of grace and truth. The same Word, Mishkan, tabernacled with us. That's showing how He wanted to be with us. And if you don't believe me, ask Isaiah. Hey, Isaiah, <laughs> 714, Isaiah says, Hey, look, I'm going to give you a sign, and the virgin will be with child, and she'll give birth to a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel, Emmanuel which means God, God with us. What did he say from the beginning? I went to Mishkan with you, and that's what Isaiah is saying. Emmanuel, God with us. And in Matthew 1, 21, you should call his name Yeshua, which means our Savior. So here, from the very beginning, he's showing he wanted to be with us. All right, now, here's the part that I said was going to blow your mind. The pattern. Hebrews 8, 5. Hold on. 
hold, hold on to the reins because we're, we're going to go for a ride here. <laughs> they serve in a system of worship that is only, he's talking about the priests, of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. Wait a minute, that's going to sink in here in a minute. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, which is right there, God gave him this warning, make sure that everything is according to the pattern I've shown you here on the mountain. Now I'm going to stop right here and paint the picture of what's going on with Moses. <clears throat> Goes up Mount Sinai, right? God's showing him all this and saying, remember the Ten Commandments and all that? Now he says, hey, I want you to build this tabernacle for me because I want to be with you and I'm going to show you a pattern of it. Okay, where's the pattern and where is he looking? Sinai. Exodus 25 8 make him a sanctuary for me so I can dwell among this make this tabernacle exactly like the pattern I will show you right all right so he's showing him but where is this Revelation eleven nineteen. then the temple of God was opened in heaven, heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. What does it say in Hebrews 8, 5? The real one in heaven. So what was Moses looking at when God was showing him the pattern? He was looking into the real one in heaven. God was showing, he says, see this? I want you to make it there. I want you to make this exactly like that. Or that exactly like that. <laughs> the real one in heaven. Does that know what it says? Yep. Is that not just mind that Moses was actually looking at the real one in heaven? Wow. Alright. This is in Shiloh or Shiloh. Uh, this is an actual picture that I took. And this is the placard that's on it. And in Shiloh is the last known location before the temple was built or finished. And when the temple was built, they didn't have any use for the tabernacle because the temple was built. So they took everything and put it in the temple. So in Shiloh, Joshua was born and he built the Mishkan, the tabernacle. It was here also the daughters of Israel went out to dance in the vineyards on the 15th of Av. I have a, a video and a lesson over that I'll get to later on. Not today, but like later on. Now, <laughs> Hannah prays for a son and gets a son named Samuel, who is the prophet that anointed Saul and who anointed David. Right? <clears throat> all from right here in Shiloh. This is where it all happened, where the tabernacle was. So just to give you an idea of how... There's a four-horned altar there. I kind of drew a circle around it. That's what it looked like the very first uh, <coughs> photographs of it from a long time ago. This is my photograph that I took when I was there. Here it says in Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, let's take this. How do you know he's talking about the Messiah, Jesus, when referring to Shiloh? Let's look at grammar. And to him. So this has to coincide with this. When it's talking about Shiloh, it says, and to him shall be the obedience. Him is referring to Shiloh. It says, until Shiloh comes. And to him, Shiloh, will be the obedience of the people. And you say, okay, so what? Well, Shiloh has a numerical value of 345. Guess what else has a numerical value of 345? El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, and Hashem. Hashem is the word that the Jews say so they won't say the name of God. And Hashem literally translated is the name. So if I was saying... Um, Chris, instead of saying Chris, I'd say the name. The name is sitting over there. 
So when I when you hear a Jew say Hashem, they're using it in place of saying God's name. <laughs> Got you there. So Shiloh, 345, El Shaddai, and the name. All right. When you get to the tabernacle, what are you supposed to do? Get a sacrifice ready to bring to the altar, come to the front gate, and enter with joy and praise. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like what we're supposed to be doing here? Bringing our sacrifice of praise, go into the front door, and with joy and praise and admiration, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Well, let's sing about it. Here's from the book of Psalms. <laughs> All these are from the book of Psalms. 65.4, blessed is the one whom you choose to bring near to dwell in your courts. We will be filled with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. So, in his courts is supposed to be goodness. 84.10, better is one day in your courts mm -hmm. than thousands elsewhere. Why? Because we're getting there. 96, 8 through 9, ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. So what are we supposed to be doing when we come to worship? We are supposed to be joyful, give glory to his name, bring our offer of sacrifice of praise. Let's go on. Psalm 100. This is a beautiful psalm. Mm -hmm. Shout to the Lord. Remember we used to sing that song? Mm -hmm. Shout to the Lord all the earth. Serve him. Now you know where it comes from. Serve the Lord with gladness and delight. Come before his presence with joyful singing. No fully and recognize with gratitude that it is the Lord himself is God. If nothing else, just thank him for who he is, is what it's saying. It is he that's made us. We are not ourselves, but we are the, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter the gates with a song of thanks, thanksgiving, and in the courts with praise. Be thankful to him, bless and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithful to all generations. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. yes. That is what you're supposed to do when you come to the tabernacle. You bring your sacrifice. You go into the gate. You're thankful. You're joyful. And you just thank Him just because He is who He is. If nothing else. Had you ever heard this before about coming into the tabernacle? Have you ever associated this song with the tabernacle? Makes you go, hmm. Huh? <laughs> All right. Isaiah 62, 9. We're talking about at the very, very end of the harvest, at the end of the year. But they who have harvested it will eat it and praise the Lord. And they have gathered it and will drink it and this is like to talk about the feast in the courtyards of my sanctuary. So we're talking about the harvest, and when they have the harvest, they bring it in and they're thankful and they give thanks and praise to the Lord. <laughs> so for most people will say the three sections are the courtyard the holy, and the holy of holies. For this, we are going to say the outer. This is the outer part, and there's the structure. This is the inner part, and the holy place is the holy of holies. And you'll see why, for me, it's easier, because when you talk about holy and holy of holies, and you say, you, well, which one, you know, but if you say outer, inner, and holy, there's no question. Are you with me so mm -hmm. about the terminology. Well, and the outer is out in the open, so... Right. That, that's that's no-brainer. So, the outer, courtyard, inner, and holy. Alright. Now, here's 
we're starting to get actually to the tabernacle. There were skilled men working together, uh, and they made ten curtains of fine twisted linen, blue, purple, and scarlet fabric with cherubim, and worked into them as an embroiderer. Bezalel made them. This is Exodus 36. Who in the world is Bezalel? Okay, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <clears throat> the name Bezalel in Hebrew means in the shadow or protection of God. Bezalel is described in the genealogical list as the son of Uri, Exodus 31.1, who is the son of Hur. And they are from the tribe of Judah. 1 Chronicles 2.18, 19.20, and 50. Now, here's the really cool part, how it all works together. If you go grandpa, dad, and son, son being Bezalel, grandpa in Hebrew means noble man, dad means my flame or my light, and we said Be Bezalel is in the shadow or protection of God. So if you look at from the tribe of Judah, the Messiah, Jesus, was a noble man who is my light, in the shadow or protection of God from the tribe of Judah. Is that not cool? And he's making all the embroidery and all the curtains and everything that may or may not look like this. This is just <laughs> an artist rendition. You see the scarlet, you see the purple, you see the blue, and you see the cherubim. All right, the blue obviously is celestial, heaven where God dwells, the purple, for royalty, king, kingdom, reign. Scarlet is for cleansing, purification, forgiveness, and also blood sacrifice. That's not much new. Everybody pretty much knew that, right? And that was all interweaved into the curtains. All right. Here's the really cool part. This is uh, Exodus 36, 12. He made 50, Bezalel, he made 50 loops in one curtain and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain which was in the second set. The loops were opposite one another. He made 50 gold hooks and joined the curtains together with the hooks so that they became a single unit. Now, 50, 50, put them together with the gold hooks, so they become a single unit, right? Gold, if you look at your uh, thing that I sent you, the key, gold means deity, all right? So you have deity combining 50 and 50. Well, what does that mean? Well, the first 50 was the Pentecost from Moses. Then you have the Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. How do you put them together? The deity of the Messiah. And watch this. 50, if you go through the Hebrew alphabet and you get the letter that has the number 50, it's the letter Nun. And Nun means son of life. So you have the deity, the son of life, combining the 50 and the 50, both Pentecosts. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. I was. All right. Now we're getting to the coverings. He made curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle, 11 in all. We're going to get to that in a minute. Each curtain was 30 by 4, 30 cubits long, 4 cubits wide. The 11 curtains were of equal size. Bezalel joined 5 and then 6 to make the 11. He made 50 loops on the edge of the outermost curtain for the first set, 50 loops on the edge of the outermost curtain for the second set, and he made bronze hooks, different, it's not gold anymore, bronze hooks to join the tent together into a unit. He made the third covering of ram skins dyed red, and a covering of, and I'll get to that in just a minute, that's Exodus 36, 19. All right, let's get to this first, and we'll get to that. On the inside, there were gold, deity. On the outside, they were bronze, which means judgment. Judgment is 
judgment. You get what you deserve. Mercy is you don't get what you deserve. That's what I want. I want mercy and grace. I don't want judgment. I don't want what I deserve. So on the outside, when you're looking at the tabernacle, you see bronze everywhere, which means judgment. But when you go inside, you see gold and deity and mercy and grace and redemption. All right, so that's what's on the outside. That's why it was bronze. Ram skins dyed red, and we're going to get to that next week. And the sea cow skins, I'm going to stop here. Some people say badger skins. Some people use other things, and I researched that till I could figure out why. Sea cows were very abundant there, and I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you why I say it's sea cow. Manatee? Manatee. Really? I'll tell you why, why I say that. <laughs> because it was waterproof. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they float good. And it was the last layer. So it would make sense that it was, you put the last coating over it, it was a waterproof coating. But anyways, I'll, I'll show you later why. All right. By the numbers. Remember you had 6, 11, and all that? All right. There were 11 curtains in all, 6 and 5. Six is the number of man of sin and imperfection. Five is God's grace and judgment and Torah. Thirty by four, remember they were thirty cubits long by four cubits wide. Thirty is the number for the dedication of blood or blood sacrifice, and four is the number for every direction, north, south, east, <coughs> west. So you have the blood of Christ, the Messiah, going north, south, to all the ends of the world. Is that not cool? And that's just in the curtains. 50 by 50, Moses, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we already went over that. Right? All right? Animal skins, here we go. And the goat's hair, redemption, sacrifice, and deliverance. The ram skin dyed red meant a covenant blessing. That's why it was red. And remember the promise of a blood sacrifice. The blood cleanses you. Remember last week we talked about the credit card? Mm -hmm. How it covered you, but the debt wasn't paid yet. But it covered you. So there was a promise coming that one day that credit card, the debt would be paid. And that's the Messiah's blood. And that's what it's talking about here. And then the sea cow skin covered through water. Remember when Jesus told uh, Nicodemus, unless a man be born of water and of spirit? Yep. And he asked, well, how can he enter the mother's womb again? Covered through the water. Also, when they parted the Red Sea, guess what was probably in the Red Sea? Sea cows. Egyptians. <laughs> <laughs> that, was that was when it closed back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That was when it closed back. Oh, okay. <laughs> so covered through water, because that's where the sea cows are. I went there. All right. Here is the tribes around the tabernacle. The ones I have circled here in red go way back to Jacob. Remember when right before he died he gave the blessings, and three of them he cursed. These were the three that he cursed. All right, there's Judah in front of the eastern gate. And here the Levites were around the tabernacle. Now, somebody mentioned last week that when you put all of these together by their numbers, there are so many numbers for Simeon, so many numbers for Reuben, so many people in Gad, that when you look at it like a bar graph, that it looks like a... Where'd you go? There. Did it look like a... A cross. You mean like that? Like I said. <laughs> like that. There it is. Oh. Yeah. Did it look like that? These were the priests here. And this was the tribe of Judah here, this larger one. So when you look at them like a bar graph because of their numbers, this is what it would have looked like. So he is showing him and teaching him what all of this, what I'm showing you. Is that not cool? Too cool. Here you go.
I told you I'd get to it. Yes, I'm so sorry I spoiled it last night. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't remember. <laughs> we didn't remember. You're good. Okay. I don't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> be, I just watched the video from last week this afternoon. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so if you look at your key that I sent to you all, here is the measurements of the tabernacle. It's 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and then the the uh, it, the inner and the holy. This was 20 by 10, and this was 10 by 10 by 10. It was 10 cubits tall. So you have 20, 10, 30, 50, 100. What does it all mean? And in that key that I gave you, you see all of this is, watch this. In the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Sheen has a numerical value of 300, which means God appears. And you say 300, yes. 100, 200, and then 50 and 50 is what? 300. 300. Hmm. Purple. <laughs> and what does 300 all the way around mean? It means God appears. And what do you say? Build me a tabernacle so that I can wow. mishkan yeah. with you. All right. 10 represents law, order, judgment, testimony. 20, redemption. 30, divine service or blood sacrifice to blood of Christ. 50 is jubilee, restoration, and Pentecost. 100 is fullness or completeness. Now, 100, 100. You see fullness, you see completeness, you see redemption, you see grace, you see mercy, you see all of it just in the dimensions mm -hmm. of the tabernacle. And remember the whole time Moses is up on the mountain and God's showing him all this. I see this in heaven, I'm showing you. All right. That's why we should come to his courts with praise and thanksgiving. Why? Because of all of this that was pre-designed for us. Just waiting for us. The completeness, all right, from your key, gold represents divinity or deity of Jesus. Silver represents redemption. Brass or bronze judgment and suffering of Christ. The goat hair represents his prophetic ministry. The ram skin represents his priestly ministry. And the badger or manatee, I say badger because that's what most Bibles has it as, but the manatee skins is humanity born of a woman. Now ram skin and his priestly ministry, I say ram because when Abraham offered Isaac what was caught in the thickets the ram to take his place and when then that's when the ministry started Abraham and so it represents a priestly ministry all right going on okay. most everything in the tabernacle was made of acacia wood and that's Christ's ability to bring life from the dead a root of a dry ground Isaiah 53 2 Resurrection. Guess what the Messiah was going to do? Be resurrected. <laughs> That's what the root out of a dry ground from the, from the uh, lineage of Jesse. Olive oil. We'll get to all that. Is Christ's anointing and it breaks Satan's yoke. Then spices from the altar of incense is a sweet fragrance of his ministry to the saints and unto God. So what do you see? If you was a foreigner and you were wandering through the desert and you saw this structure and all these people, what in the world would you see? You would see bronze pillars with silver tops. Bronze represents judgment. But the silver tops, watch this. Watch this. Psalm 121.1 I will lift my eyes unto the hills from where my help comes from. You're not looking at judgment of what you deserve anymore. You're looking up at the silver tops, which is redemption where your help comes from. 
Does that make sense? That's why it says, I will lift my eyes. He doesn't want you to look down at the judgment. He wants you to look up to the redemption. Out. There's a... Out. <laughs> All right. To enter the courtyard, you have to go through Judah. Remember, Judah was the largest one there. You have to go through Judah, and Judah was the one ass assigned to praise. All right. So there are three parts. The courtyard, the inner, and the holy. And there are three parts to us, the body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. All right? All right? What does it mean? The outer court is our redemption. The inner court is our maturity. And the holy place is our intimacy. And what that means is the outer court is the body. The inner court is the soul. And the holy is the spirit. Now, this is a process. You can't... The high priest couldn't just run right into the Holy of Holies. There was a process. And I believe that this is why the church has lost its power. Because they've forgotten the process. They want to just go right to the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> and there's a process. All right. You got to mature first. Yeah. And I'll more about that later. Let me tell you about Solomon. When Solomon built the temple, he asked for wisdom. Right? Proverbs twenty or Proverbs two six. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth, the Lord comes knowledge and understanding. Now he mentions three: wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Right? Knowledge. This is from Proverbs one seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Understanding, Proverbs 2.1. Turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. So your heart needs to go to here. Then the last one is wisdom, Proverbs 10.13. Wisdom is found on the lips who has understanding, but a rod for the back is devoid of understanding. <laughs> Do not forsake wisdom, for it will protect you. Love her. She will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. And though it costs you everything, get understanding. Now, wait a minute. Why did it say get understanding? Why didn't it say get wisdom? Because this is a process. You have to start here, go to here, and then you can operate in here. The only way that I knew how to even come close to describing this, my son helped me with this, is this. This is a Bugatti <laughs> Veyron. There's a poppy. <laughs> is that what you named your dog? Yes. <laughs> I know, I have knowledge that this is a Bugatti. Right? Now let's move to the understanding. I understand that it can go 0 to 60 in 2.2 seconds. Wow. I understand that it has 1,200 horsepower, and I understand that it has a 257 mile per hour top speed. I understand all this. So I know what it is. Understanding is also getting in the driver's seat and discovering some of these things. This is the knowledge. This is all the specs right here, right? That's the knowledge. The understanding is actually trying to drive it and get used to it. Now, where does the wisdom part come in? The wisdom is, the wisdom is, I am not going to drive this on the snow and ice. That's wisdom. Right? Yeah. I'll drive it on the Autobahn. Will you get me one? Yeah. On the Civic wannabe. And it's only 1.657 million. Oh, exactly. mm -hmm. The one accident will take care of that. <laughs> yeah. So the wisdom, part, yeah. pothole, pothole. the wisdom part, the wisdom part says, I'm not going to drive it on I-24 with all the potholes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wisdom says, I'm not going to drive it in snow and ice or in the sand or anything else like that. That's the wisdom part. The wisdom knows, takes the knowledge and understanding and puts a little bit of safeguard to it. Protection. That's why it says wisdom will protect you. All right? 
So does that make sense? So that a, if you <laughs> that all right. So that. Yeah. So what does it mean? The outer court is where you get your knowledge. You know your Redeemer. You come to know Jesus. You know His grace. You know His mercy. That's the outer court. That's where the knowledge is. Then when you get to the inner court, it's understanding. That's where your maturity comes in. That's where you get your anointing. That's where you get the five-fold ministry. That's where you get... That's where the maturity comes in. Then... <coughs> Then you can get to the Holy of Holies where the wisdom comes in. That's where you get your intimacy with God. That's where the power comes in. When you tap into this here right now, that's when you get the power. and Because it's pure Holy Spirit then. Because that's why he says those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. That means you've got to get to here. So, everybody with me on that one? Yes. All right. This one's a good one. How much did it cost? All right. Gold was up a little bit, but when I did this, it was at 1,700 per ounce. So, Exodus 38, 24 tells 29 talents of gold, 730 shekels. It's 2,800 pounds of gold. Oh, my. A ton and a half. 44,800 ounces at 1,700 an ounce gives you a grand total of 76.160 million dollars. <laughs> 76, that's at 1,700 an ounce. Today it was 1,730 something, so it would have been more than that. All right, how much did it cost? Let's go over. 76.1 for the gold, 2.3 million for the silver, 20,000 for the bronze, grand total 78 million 480,000, almost 78 and a half million dollars. Why did you forget the, the curtains? Yeah, just in the precious metal. Yeah, that's just the metal. <laughs> yeah. That's not the covers and the ramskins and all that. That's just the metal. Ow. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so that's how much it costs. And just think, where did they get all this? This is how much they brought out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. That's how much they brought out of Egypt and still had some left over. Because it's the only, it's the only time in history where Moses said, quit bringing me stuff. Where a preacher said, quit bringing me stuff. <laughs> All right. This part is really cool. We met these people in Israel. This is Sergio and Rhoda, and this is from their website. A website, a podcast or something. Yeah, they do. It's really good. They went to this place. It's really cool. If I can get it to play, you can get it to I believe. For our last and final stop today, we are heading to a very unique attraction. When I read the book of Exodus, I always imagined that because of millions of Israelites going through the desert, that the tabernacle would have been very, very large. It would have been giant. So the priests would be able to perform their Levitical duties. This tent is actually built according to the exact size given by God himself to Moses, as it is written in the book of Exodus. The size in the Bible is given in ancient biblical cubit measurement. And most scholars agree that it should be around 75 feet wide and 150 feet long. And now that we're here and I'm seeing the life-size tabernacle, I can't believe my eyes. The tabernacle is not as giant as I always pictured it. It's actually more of the size of an Olympic pool. I thought it would be bigger because the people were a lot, but um, one of the workers reminded me of how much they have to carry. So that makes sense. If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Of course, they needed to take it down, carry it in the desert, then put it back up. It just wouldn't make sense to build something the size of a Herod's second temple and then keep on taking it down and putting it back up while in the desert. 
I've just never given it proper thought. And I'm so glad that I can see it now. So the next time I read the text in Exodus account, I'm properly able to imagine how it looked like. So the visual always gives that benefit. And I'm so glad I was able to see this. It's awesome. Walking into this tent, seeing the artifacts, touching them, it does help me understand of the physical specifications that God instructed the Israelites to build. But it doesn't explain why. Why is the veil there? Why was it blue, purple, and scarlet? Why did God instruct to have bread on the table at all times? Why were there two cherubim on the ark? God gave so many meticulous details, and they all have very important purpose and great symbolism. In Exodus chapter 40, God instructed Moses the exact order in which this tabernacle should be set up every time they take it down and move it to a new place. And the order was pretty simple. After the Ark of the Covenant and the veil was in place, they were to put the table of showbread, then the menorah, then the screen door to the tent. And here's what's striking. In the book of John, Jesus proclaimed himself in the exact same order that matches these elements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. It's an incredible match. But it doesn't stop here. There are seven I am proclamations, and they all follow the exact same pattern as the tabernacle setup. And the thing is, Jesus did not say these things in one sentence. Between each I am, there was days, months. And when John wrote them down, it's also not in the same verse. It's spread out through chapters. And so this order was there, but as far as we know, nobody's ever found it before. This is very recent. This was found just a couple of years ago. So this means this pattern couldn't have been contrived. And it means that it could have not been there by chance. So if you're interested to know more about the tabernacle, its significance and the symbolism, you should watch this study by Charlie Garrett. The link is in the description of this video below. Or we can chit chat with Steve. Mm -hmm. So here is, if you want, if you're <coughs> following along, these were the seven table of showbread, the menorah, the door, the altar, the wash basin or the laver, the courtyard, and then the anointing priests. And in the book of John, he says 635, the bread of life, light of the world, 812, the door, 107, good shepherd, 1011, resurrection, 1125, I am the way, 146, and I am the bind, chapter 15, 5 through 8. That was in the video that. So how did you guys see that? And have you ever heard though any of these in the book of John? Hmm. Related back to Tabernacle? Hmm. I never have. No. Not been around a while. <laughs> 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 I've been in church for a whole lot. <laughs> how long is it? <laughs> Seventy years? <laughs> so did the first three really open your eyes? And then he went through the whole seven, the whole seven from the book of John in the seven items, and we're going to go through every single item that's mentioned. Is that not the coolest? That's the coolest. All right. That's why he says, listen, I'm standing knocking at the door. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will eat together. Revelation 3.20. So can you see how everything that was said in the New Testament relays back to the Old Testament? And the tabernacle is the key to it all. And I'm going to spoil some of it here. Remember how I said the church has lost its power? And here's what I meant by the church has lost its power. It's a process. You have the outer, and then the inner, and then the holy. And a lot of Christians are in the outer, 
And that's where they stay. They never go in to get the maturity. And it's in the outer, what I call the hokey pokey faith. And the hokey pokey faith is you put your right arm in, put your right arm, right arm out, and you shake it all about. And you, you want to go in and get the maturity, and you see the anointing, you see, the, and you say, nah, I'm going to stay out here. And what you get is the person that goes to the altar all the time. They keep going back to the altar, keep going back to the altar, keep going. Why? Because there's no maturity. They don't go in. They stay in the outer. What's in the outer? The altar of sacrifice. That's the altar. And there's a video that I'll show you later on with uh, Perry Stone about the three types of altars that will bring all that home. But there's a process, the outer, the inner, the holy, and when you get through that process, when you get to that holy, it's nothing but spirit, and that's where the power, and that's where the glory, and that's where, that's where you get the miracles, that's where you get the healing, that's where you get the salvation, that's where you get the intercessory prayer answer.